Welcome to Vineyard Church Online. My name is Andy Mead. We are launching into a new series we do every November at the movies. Super excited about this. We're going to be looking at very, very inspirational movies this year and movies that are based on true stories. You know, some people, they just want 2020 to get past them as quick as possible. With all of the things that have gone on, they're just thinking this was one of the worst years of my life and I don't want to have to think about it again. But you know, these movies really would argue a different point that you could really grow and experience something unique out of difficult circumstances that you can take as part of your life and your life becomes better because of that. And so we're going to be looking at that today. But let me just say a couple of things. One is, is spoiler alert, uh, if you haven't seen the movie, we will be covering it all. But because of the nature of these movies, it's only going to enrich it because we're going to look at it from a biblical, redemptive viewpoint. So when you do watch the movie, it'll be even more uh, impacting and enriching for you. Here's a couple of things that you can do as if you're uh, online watching uh, to get the most out of it is we are providing the video links for you in the chat box next to you. Uh, and you can just pause the movie. Just pause right where you're at, watch the video clip, come back, and you won't miss a beat. We're going to be looking at the, the actual written script, but that's not the same. I mean, these guys are top, top, and, and gals are top actors and actresses. Uh, you'll want to see it from their performance. Also, feel free to eat some popcorn, even if it's in the morning, popcorn and Coke. That's, you get a waiver for November. Uh, hope that you enjoy it like that. Well, everybody knows about, uh, especially people my age, about Mr. Rogers. He did a children's show called Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, real popular jingle uh, that when he would come in, he would always sing. Now, just as a caveat, full disclosure, I didn't really like it, this show when I was a kid, so I didn't really watch it, but I know about it, and the movie is quite a bit different because it is not a kid's show. Uh, it wasn't. It's not targeted for kids like the like the uh, the one in the 70s and 80s, how that was targeted for kids. This movie is targeted for adults, about adults working through their emotions. That was the theme of the show. He would help kids work through difficult topics. Interestingly, it's a lot of the same things that help us. Uh, we think, oh yeah, kid, adult emotions are different. They're really not, is one of the things we discover in this. And so the actors that they chose are all-star actors for Fred Rogers they have Tom Hanks, and he does a fantastic job, uh, is nominated uh, by the Academy Awards for his, his uh, acting here, uh, and just does a terrific job of playing the compassionate, the kind, the generous Mr. Rogers. The script, the storyline really comes, as I said, from a true story about this guy, uh, who he, he was a writer for the men's magazine Esquire. His name is Tom Junod, and he wrote this uh, article called uh, Can You Say Hero? It ended up being the featured piece about Mr. Rogers. It didn't start out that way, but it ended like that, being this life-changing experience for him that just began as an interview. And the guy who plays Tom Ar Junard, they actually changed his name to Lloyd Vogel, and it is Matthew Rees, the Welsh actor, does a absolutely outstanding job as he grows in his emotional understanding and healing through this, uh, this terrific movie. And so the, the title of the Esquire comes from Can You Say? And because Mr. Rogers would do that in his show. Can you say this? Because he was speaking to preschoolers. And so he adds hero. I kind of took that same concept because we see some amazing, amazing biblical themes that come through this movie. And so I decided to call it uh, How to Be Somebody's Hero. Because these are really heroic things. Uh, that I think everybody needs. And we can be a hero to somebody. How do you do it? Well, first, be a friend. That is the beginning. And that's where we begin the movie. That here, Mr. Rogers is introducing uh, some of his friends. He has what he calls a friendship board. And he's, you know, Mr. McFeely is this guy who comes by and, and sees him regularly. It's one of his television friends. He has a couple puppet friends he introduces. And then he introduces this guy, 
uh, who is a new friend of his, uh, Lloyd Vogel. And, um, and it really shows how Mr. Rogers is embodying what it means to be a friend what it means to be a friend, other than having some kind of odd picture of him up here. Uh, he's showing that a friend is empathetic. A friend is loving. And we see that uh, in this script. Here's how it goes. It says, Mr. Rogers says, I'd like you to meet a friend of mine. His name is Lloyd Vogel. Somebody has heard him. Now, you can see that uh, in the video, in the movie, because his face is all, uh, you know, beat up. But not just on his face. He is having a hard time forgiving. So now he's saying, hey, there's a connection. There's something else going on inside him that you can't see. To forgive, it's a decision we make to release a person from the feelings of anger we have toward them. It's strange, but sometimes it's hardest of all to forgive someone we love. So this is his introduction to the kids. Really, as the audience, it's our introduction as well, that Lloyd here is going through quite a bit of trauma emotionally about going through life and working through some struggles he had with his father and currently has. And so being, but it begins with him being a friend. He's kind of entering in to this guy's world and he introduces him as a friend. The Bible says, love from the center of who you are. Don't fake it. Be good friends who love deeply. And so this really becomes the bedrock of what it means to be a friend is learning to love somebody, getting into their world. You, you really can't be friends with everybody. You can be friendly to everybody, but to be friends means you're going to kind of get into their boat with them a little bit. You're going to help discover, hey, how can I help you in life a little bit? I want to certainly understand you a little bit. The Bible says a friend loves at all times. Great definition of a friend, always being loving. But he says there's another level to friendship. And he says a brother is born for a time of adversity. And I think we all know that. That when you go through difficulty with somebody, somebody's there with you as you're processing some of the biggest challenges of life, there's a deeper level of friendship. Yeah, they're friends, but they're more like a brother. They're more like a family member, more like a sister, somebody very, very close. And this is what the hero of Mr. Rogers is doing is he realizes that uh, Lloyd's going through a real difficult time and he wants to be there for him. Here's my first truth. I have a truth with each point. Uh, love is entering the world of those in pain. And love, of course, is the bedrock for friendship. And so that's what it means to be somebody's friend is stepping into their world, especially when they're going through something that is painful. So this movie continues on and we see that uh, that. Lloyd is this writer, this editor for this magazine, Esquire. He's been given an assignment that he really doesn't want. Uh, he sees himself uh, as, a, as, a, as a writer of doing different types of pieces. He's given what he calls a puff piece to go interview this children's personality. Uh, and he doesn't want to do it. He does it under duress. And he ends up going and interviewing Mr. Rogers for this small piece that's supposed to be in the back of the magazine. Mr. Rogers has read all of his works, realizes that this guy is very caustic, very harsh, views the world and views people in the world very, very, uh, you know, in, in, in negative ways. And so he, he accepts the interview price precisely because of that. And so he's on, a, they're both on an assignment is what we defined, is that, that Lloyd is on this assignment to just get an interview, check off the box. He doesn't even want to be there. And Mr. Rogers is on the assignment to help bring healing into this guy's life. Here's how this, and so it's be observant. Be observant. If you're going to you, you be a hero in somebody's life, you need to observe and see what's going on behind the scenes. So here's the interview. Here's how it goes. This will be an issue about heroes, Lloyd says in his interview. He goes, do you consider yourself a hero? So here's Mr. Rogers' response. I don't think of myself as a hero. No, not at all. We'll come back to that in just a moment. He said, Lloyd says, what about Mr. Rogers? Is he a hero? Mr. Rogers says, I don't even understand what you're talking about. What's that question? He goes, well, there's you, Fred, and then there's the character you play, Mr. Rogers. So for Mr. Rogers, they were one and the same. He starts to see that there's duplicity in in, uh, in Lloyd, that Lloyd's hiding something. Now we all wear masks, and Lloyd is wearing a mask, not a mask uh, for the coronavirus. It's a mask about hiding his emotions. But because Mr. Rogers is observant, 
he's wanting, he's starting to probe beyond that. So here's what he says is he says, you said there was a play at the plate. So he asked him earlier about where did the black eye come from, the gash in his face. He said he was playing softball. So he probes a little more. He goes, is that really what happened to you, Lloyd? He goes, no, actually, I got into a fight. He says, oh, well, who did you get in a fight with? He goes, well, it's not important. And then he kind of confesses. He goes, it's Jerry. He goes, well, who's Jerry? He goes, it's my father. So now he's really starting to reveal what's going on. And this terrible uh, uh, facial wound is from his dad. He goes, oh, my gosh, I can't believe that. He goes, I'd rather, I don't want to talk about it. Mr. Rogers says, well, what were you and your father fighting about? So he's not letting it go. He's going, what really happened? How are you really doing? What's going on there? He goes, well, I'm here to interview Mr. Rogers. And Mr. Rogers says, well, that is what we are doing, isn't it? And so here there's this uh, going back and forth. And it's not just, he's not going to just let him out without really investigating because not only he wants to be his friend and he's stepping into the pain that he's in, but he's also observant. There are signs, there's cues. You know, there's often cues if we're looking for them. So often we don't look for them because we're just, we're caught up in our own stuff. And, and certainly Mr. Rogers could have. The interview was all about him. <clears throat> for many, many kids and parents, he was a hero. He could have easily fallen into that. He doesn't, though. He says, the Bible says, don't allow self-promotion to hide your hearts, but be authentic in humility. Put others first and view others as more important than yourself. So instead of self-promotion, yeah, I guess I am a hero. No, he, he's, he's, it's this great explanation of how you put others first. Sometimes we have a hard time knowing how do you do that. Mr. Rogers in this movie does a terrific job. He says, hey, there's obviously something going on in your life. We don't need to be just necessarily talking about me. He says, abandon every display of selfishness. Possess a greater concern for what matters to others instead of your own interests. So he certainly was given an easy path just to get this interview done, talk about himself, but instead he, he starts to be observant and says, what's really going on in your life? And he was busy. He was very, very busy. But that leads to the second truth. As long as you're thinking of yourself, you're just caught up in your own busyness and all what you've got to do and all the things you're going through, you're probably going to miss opportunities to help other people. And so if you're going to help other people, which is what we're talking about is being a hero in somebody's life. To be a friend, you're going to have to slow down to see what's going on in their life, to see what painful stuff they're going on so that you don't, you don't miss that. That really leads us to the third way to be a hero in somebody's life, and that's to be a role model. Now, Mr. Rogers is not perfect. He has his own set of pressures and problems that come his way, and they're in a discussion and uh, that comes out. He says, hey, what about all the people that are dumping their problems on you? How are you dealing with it? Here's what he says. Lloyd says, it seems like all these people line up to tell you their problems. Mr. Rogers says, isn't it wonderful? Such bravery. Then Lloyd says, well, it seems like that would be an incredible burden on you. Mr. Rogers says, well, I'm grateful for you saying that. I'm grateful for your compassion. He goes, but is it a burden? He goes, there's no life that is free from pain. Lloyd says, how do you deal with all that? So he's asking for the interview, but it becomes clear in this movie he's asking for himself as well. Here's how Mr. Rogers responds. He says, well, there's many ways that you can deal with your feelings without hurting yourself or somebody else. He says, you can pound a lump of clay. You can swim as fast as you can. You can play the lowest notes at the same time. Now, he's giving examples, but he's actually giving examples from his whole life, from his, from his own life. He does play the piano. He swims every day. Um, I'm guessing he does the, the, the clay. Or uh, He also, we learn in the movie that he, every day he, he prays and he reads scripture. And so these are the ways that he is processing his own difficulties, his own pain in his life. We find out also that he had pain about uh, raising his kids, and that comes out. And, and so he, he's a role model. He's not just saying, oh, do as I say, not as I do. That doesn't work biblically. That doesn't, that's not the way God wants us to be a role model. He wants us to actually do it ourselves, and this is a great example of him doing that. He says, do you ever talk to anybody? And then he just says, well, you know, and he, boom, I just played the piano. Uh, and he goes, then let me, I, I want you to meet some of my special puppet friends. And so then he introduces uh, this puppet 
uh, Daniel Tiger. And Daniel Tiger is interviewing uh, the interviewer, which is Lloyd Vogel. And he says, you know, did you have a special puppet? And it turns out he did, Old Rabbit. And this plays a key role, this Daniel Tiger, because Daniel Tiger becomes a projection of, of what Lloyd is going through on how he can't really share his feelings. Well, that happens to be the problem of this puppet. So here's we see now things that kids go through and how they use puppets to help them with their emotions. Really, uh, somebody who's really stuck, a puppet can kind of help as well as there. It's kind of a uh, acute part, but very insightful part of this movie. Here's what the Bible says about being a role model. It says, show them all this by doing it yourself. Incorruptible in your teaching, your word solid and saying. So he says, you got to do it yourself. You can't, you can't just stand on the sidelines and coach. You, we're all in this together, this thing called life. Then anyone who is dead set against us when he finds nothing weird or misguided might eventually come around. That leads me to the third truth, which is there is no life for your friend. So we all need to role model how to process our emotions, how to deal with the feelings that are painful, the disappointments of life. Uh, nobody gets a free pass. And so if we're going to be a hero in somebody's lives, we have to be willing to walk that path ourselves as well. Number four is be honoring. When we honor somebody, the Bible talks about honor your father and your mother. Well, we know in this movie here, Lloyd is struggling with his father, the way his father had treated him. We find out that his father, when, he, when Lloyd was just a young boy, he, that he left him and his sister. His mother was dying of cancer, left the mother, not totally uncompassionate, not caring about them all, having different affairs, leaving the family, letting them just uh, process all that pain uh, by themselves. He wasn't there. And then he comes in later and he, and, he, and he wants to reconcile. Well, Lloyd now is coming to the conclusion he has not dealt with that pain very well. And that he sees the pain going on in his emotions and he realizes that, hey, I, uh, uh, I think, I'm, I think I'm, I'm, I'm damaged or something. I'm just, I haven't done it well. I've been angry a lot. It's, it's leached into my writings. And so they have this key meeting in this uh, in this restaurant that's serving this great Asian, Asian cuisine, cuisine. And here's how this conversation goes. Uh, Lloyd says, Bill was right. That's, uh, that's Mr. Rogers' manager. He says, you love people like me. Mr. Rogers says, what are people like you? I've never met anyone like you in my entire life. And Lloyd says, broken people. So this is how he's interpreting now. He's come to this conclusion that he's, he's damaged goods. He says, I don't think you were broken, Mr. Rogers says. I know you're a man of conviction. A person knows the difference between what is right and what is wrong. Try to remember that your relationship with your father also helped to shape those parts. He helped you become what you are. So this is this excellent, beautiful description of what it means to honor. When all we can see, when somebody opens up, and they start sharing their weakness, start sharing their limitations, start sharing their, their areas that they see as broken and damaged. How we reflect back makes all the difference. And we can be honoring in that. The Bible says, love each other with brotherly affection and take delight in honoring each other. How do we do that? Well, when somebody shares their weakness, instead of labeling them, you're broken. I mean, he could have, Mr. Rogers could have done that. Said, you're right, you are a mess. You're all screwed up. You're going to need years and years of therapy. This isn't what he does. Instead, he says, no, actually, God can still use that. That's a redemptive way to look at our past pain. How does God use that to shape who you are? How does God do that to, uh, to the, the place you are today? The good things, that they, they're actually rooted in that. And here's a beautiful verse for that. So I will celebrate my weakness, Paul says, for when I am weak, I sense more deeply the mighty power of Christ living in me. So I'm not defeated by my weakness. See, often we get stuck there. We don't want to talk about it. We hide it. We wear the mask because we feel defeated by our weakness. He goes, no, no, I'm not. In fact, I'm delighted. Why? Because God used that in my life to advance his cause. And it's really true. If we reflect and we see how God used even the painful things in our lives. It made all the difference in the world. Fourth truth, we honor people 
when we choose to see the good in them, when we choose to see the good in them. That leads me to the fifth way to be a hero, and that's to be intentional, to be intentional. And so here we see in this next scene, uh, here we have uh, the scene's a night scene, so it's a little difficult to see, but it's, it's Lloyd with his wife, Andrea, and he's confessing to her about the, how he's not been there for her. He's not, he's not been supportive. He's, not been, uh, he's let anger kind of cause some destruction in their relationship. And, and he realizes that it's not going to go well if he doesn't deal with it. And so here's what he says. He says, listen, I realize that I have to deal with my feelings, but I'm scared, which is why in the hospital I had to, and I've been, uh, I had to be gone so long. He goes, I, and, that, and here's where the confession starts to happen. He says, I get really angry. And I know it's a way of saying, I can't deal with this. And I love that part because I think that describes so many people when they don't handle their emotions, they don't work through them. Through however you need to do that, with a friend and a counselor, whatever, that spills out. It just spills out and, and often with anger or frozen anger, with just depression, all kinds of ways, very destructive ways, not, not helpful. And he says, and he goes, uh, get away, saying, get away from me. But that's not what I want. It's actually the opposite of what I want. You and Gavin, which is his son, you're what I want. So here he describes, hey, I'm finding motivation for something better. And Mr. Rogers was that person to speak truth, even though when he kept repelling him or repelling him. Makes me think of this wonderful verse. Better is an open rebuke than hidden love. Wounds from a friend. How many of you have had wounds from a friend can be trusted? See, part of being a friend was willing to speak the truth, to help him to go through some of those challenging times in his life, to get in his boat, to not be judgmental, to instead, instead be uh, somebody who's going through it themselves and, and being sympathetic and compassionate, all those things. Fifth truth, figuring out what you want gives you motivation. So here Lloyd figured it out. He goes, you know what? I want a good relationship. I don't want to end up divorced. I don't want to end up and all these kinds of problems with my kids. I don't want that curse to continue on in my home. And he goes, so that's giving me motivation. Motivation for what? To face my feelings. Motivation even when I'm scared and I don't know what, you know, going through this, this, this tunnel that's dark and, and frightening. What could happen? What's, this whole thing could blow apart. I could become somebody different that I don't like. I mean, all kinds of fears. But the motivation comes, what do I really want? I want something better than this and moving towards that. And that's why it's a truth. And he certainly did that. Lastly is be accessible. I think being in there in the moment with somebody and being a bridge, because sometimes it seems so far away. It's a great scene. This final scene, certainly my favorite scene, is a family scene at the end. It turns out the father uh, is dying. By this point, Lloyd has really done a lot to reconcile, has forgiven his father and done a lot to reconcile. They're actually talking about having maybe a family vacation, but his father's dying, so he's probably not going to live that long. Well, Mr. Rogers shows up. He's accessible. He's in that space. And as a conversation's going around that he's not really part of, the subject of death comes up because what if they, they probably can't go on vacation? And then over the room comes this, this time that's super awkward of silence. And Mr. Rogers sees that, and nobody knows what to say. They're, they are literally stuck because they don't. nobody wants to talk about death because it's one of those things you just don't talk about. And so here's how that, this, this part of the scene goes. He says, you know, death is something many are uncomfortable speaking about. That's Mr. Rogers saying. He says, but to die is human, and anything human is mentionable, anything mentionable is manageable. So he, bring, he takes something that's in the dark, in the closet, brings it out. It's still difficult. He hasn't made it easy. He's just saying, we can talk about it. And when you take something out of the secrets, out of the darkness, in there, it, all this fear and shame, all kinds of things happen. When you bring it out, all of a sudden, it makes it where it's more manageable. And that's what he says. Is he goes, it's more manageable. And and Mr. Rogers helps make that bridge from the unspeakable to the speakable to the manageable. I think that God did that through Jesus Christ. He, sh- he demonstrated that. And we are to be an embodiment of God in, to the world around us. For some people, they'll never go to church. 
And so we're the only Bible they'll ever read. We're the only uh, Jesus Christ they're ever going to experience. And so we get to clothe, the Bible says actually, like clothe ourselves with such a way where we represent God to others. We become accessible to God through us. It says, chosen by God for this new life of love. Dress in the wardrobe God picked out for you. What's that wardrobe look like? What does God want you to wear? Here's what we need to be wearing. Compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength, discipline. Those are what make us accessible uh, to people so that they can feel like they can connect with the Lord. And regardless of what else you put on, wear love. It's your basic, all-purpose garment Never be without it. That leads me to the sixth point here, which is anything mentionable is manageable. I took it right from the, the script out of the movie because I thought it was just so good that when, when we talk about something, it becomes manageable. You know, there's a lot of things we don't talk about. They're unmentionables. People find out they have an illness and they won't tell anybody. They won't tell their loved ones because it's unmentionable. People have... Uh, all kinds of shame issues with maybe an addiction or a drug and, you know, a drug, a drug problem. They won't talk about it. And so it becomes this secret. There's family secrets. There's people that are lonely that don't want to share about their loneliness because they feel like they will be labeled in some way. There's people that have uh, different kinds of confusion about about their identity and they feel uncomfortable about talking about that because all of a sudden they'll be you know, uh, viewed a different way. Certainly death, suicide. Oh, there are plenty of unmentionables. And when they stay in that category, they become unmanageable. It doesn't work well. We can't really process our emotions well. We need one another. We need to be able to share that. Now, in our church, we have tried to create a, 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 a culture where that's okay. Where it's okay to talk about your weaknesses, your limitations. It's okay to talk about the fears and those things that are going on in your life. And we're going to support one another, not shame one another, label one another, or all those other kinds of things that are not helpful at all. And so you need a place where you can find support. You know, there's a number of names for God in the Bible, but one of my favorites is when he talks about him being called the Word, because the spoken Word the written word. The word can be so powerful. It can bring healing. It can bring life. It can change somebody's life. It can be, we can be a hero to somebody through our words. And he says, the word became flesh and blood. In other words, that's God's name, the word, and it became Jesus Christ and moved into the neighborhood. You know what is, makes a beautiful neighborhood? It's when the good news is in the neighborhood, when God shows up and we get to be the embodiment. We get to demonstrate what it means to be a friend, to, uh, to recognize where somebody's at in their pain. We get, to rec- we get to be somebody who's observable. We're not so busy with our own selves that we don't have time to see what other people are going through. Help people to remove their masks. Help them to step into deeper relationships. We get to be people that are role models. We're doing it ourselves. We're not just st- standing out on the, uh, the sidelines yelling in. No, we're, we're actually owning up to our own challenges because no life is free from pain. We also get to be people that are honoring of others, that we help them to see the redemptive work of God and how they, God is at work in their life, even through those painful places in their lives. We also get to be people that are intentional. We're helping them take those next steps. We're helping them to grow and, and, and not just say, it's, I'll always be this way, I'm broken. Uh, no, to move out of the, maybe the destructive ways that we've used our, our, our emotions and help them to grow in that. And then lastly, just to be accessible. We can be a hero to people. We can help them as they grow, uh, not just Uh, physically, but emotionally and even spiritually. God wants us to do that. And I love the themes of this movie because it says, you know what? It can be you as well. So let's pray and we'll close. Father, thank you, Lord, for this terrific movie uh, uh, and such amazing biblical themes that come out of it that we can be somebody's hero. It's not way out there. It's something tangible we can do every day. And some people, honestly, they need us. They need us to step into that place of being their hero. Some of you need that in your life. You need somebody who 
is a friend to you, who understands what you're going through, is observable, is, is, is helps you because they're doing it themselves. They're not, it's not, they're better than you. They're, they're in the same stuff. And they're helping you to see how God is at work in your life. You know, God wants to do that for you. God says that about you. He says, you know, you're, some of you have said to yourself, I'm broken. I'm no longer usable. And let me just say, God's view of you is this, that is not true. That is not true. God says you're usable. You're lovable. You're redeemable. He, God says, I have a plan for you. And it's a good plan. God says, help, let me help you. And begins, it just all begins with prayer, saying, God, I, I want to I be more healed up. Help me. Would you do that right now, just in your, na- in, in your mind, just say, God, today, I want, to, I want the goodness of God, the word spoken over me, the words of life. Do that. And then just say, God, today, I want to put my faith in you. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you know, God's all about doing some amazing things in our lives. Uh, One of the ways that we want to do is to support you in prayer. If you prayed to ask Christ into your life, please let me know about it. You can just type a text to to me, know God. If you have a prayer request, you can type in pray and we can uh, find out how we can pray and support you. You can do that to 757-704-5504. And if you're just joining us, don't feel pressured to give. But, you know, some people say, this is a place where I'm, uh, I get fed. This is a place where I feel connected to. And we'd love to have your financial support. Certainly, it's a big part of what we do uh, in the vineyard. And here's some ways that you can give. Uh, if you're on Vineyard Live, there's a give button there, along with a prayer button, along with a way for you to help us to know how we can pray for you. But also, you can text 45777 and then just put in VCC in the amount. We'd love to... Uh, to partner with you as we bring the gospel in relevant ways to people all over the country, really all over the world. Well, the Lord bless you. Can't wait to see you uh, until next week. It's going to be a terrific, terrific movie. You won't want to miss that. See you next week.